Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining with me for this third Sunday of Advent. Let me pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to look at your word and come before you again today. Help us to be open to the things you want us to learn from you. And may you be with me that I might teach well and that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So our sermon for today is about John the Baptist. And so for our opening illustration, I thought that I would share a John the Baptist dad joke uh, and then also give, give us some interesting facts about John the Baptist. So first, the joke. Do you know what John the Baptist and Kermit the Frog have in common? Their middle name. As for the interesting facts, uh, let's see how many of these you know. So John the Baptist was the son of Zechariah, a Jewish priest, and Elizabeth, who was the cousin of Mary, Jesus' mother. His birth, John's birth, was miraculous in that his parents were quite old and his mom was considered barren, so they were unable to have children. John was uh, born about six months before Jesus. Um, and he is known, John the Baptist is known for living out in the wilderness where he wore clothes that were made out of camel hair and ate locusts and wild honey. Sounds appetizing, doesn't it? He, would, he also was eventually beheaded in 31 AD. And did you know that his birthday is celebrated by the Catholic Church on June 24th? So while you may have known all of those things, maybe you didn't know that Muslims believe in John the Baptist as well. They call him Prophet Yahya, and he is spoken about in the Quran, where he is known for his life, lived out in the wilderness, wearing camel hair clothes and eating honey and wild fruits and leading people in the way of Allah. Interesting, right? Well, let's take a closer look at John the Baptist's ministry from the Bible. Please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. So today is week three of our Advent series as we move closer and closer to Christmas and uh, the celebration of the birth of Christ our Savior. Today we move on to a passage in the Gospel of Luke that is maybe not one of the passages that we might expect uh, to look at as we draw near to Christmas. Luke 1 contains the story of the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary to, to give her the news that she would be giving birth to the Messiah. And then a, a, a little later in that chapter we have Mary's Magnificat. And both of those passages are well-known nativity or advent kind of passages. And and then the next chapter, Luke 2, contains the story of Jesus' birth and, and the angels appearing to the shepherds and, and even a few stories about things that took place after Christ's birth. Uh, but we're picking things up in chapter 3, a passage that is not only not about the birth of Christ, it doesn't even mention the name of Jesus. But Advent is not just about looking at the stories that lead up to the nativity or prophesy about it. It's about preparing our hearts to celebrate what Christmas is all about. And while this passage may not cause us to consider the nativity itself, it will point us to Jesus and all that he came to do. Now, typically, I like to begin with a little context, but the beginning of this passage kind of sets the stage for all uh, for the passage as a whole by itself. So let's pick things up with Luke 3 with verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So the first two verses here help, help us with the timeline. One of the great things about Luke is that he was a detailed historian who gave us names and events that help us anchor his words in specific periods of history. For instance, Tiberius Caesar would have been the ruler of the Roman Empire after Caesar Augustus, and he ruled from AD 14 to 37, although he was co-ruler for a bit of a period before that. Now, there are some different ways of counting the years of his reign, depending upon whether they use the Roman or the Syrian method, but most likely this would have taken place, this passage would have taken place 
uh, sometime around AD 27 to 29. In addition, this list of names of rulers and regents can help us not only fix the time period, but also give us a glimpse into the state, affair, state of affairs in the region. This list contains a variety of political, administrative, and even religious leaders or authorities during that time. And in these verses, we're reminded that the people of Israel were not living in their own nation with a kingdom or a democracy or something like that, but were subjects of the Roman Empire and part of a complex and confusing region of governors and administrators, some of whom were corrupt or even imbalanced or erratic. In addition, this passage takes place decades after Christ's birth, but before he has begun his earthly ministry. It was a time period in the history of Israel when they were finishing up what was known as the 400 years of silence, when there was no prophetic presence amongst the people of Israel. All of that helps us understand that this was a bit of a dark and uncertain time in Israel's history. Verse 2 introduces us to the main character of the passage, John the Baptist, who steps into this 400-year prophetic void. And his introduction is even reminiscent of the Old Testament prophets. And based on what we know of his ministry, we can estimate that this passage would have taken place about six months before Jesus began his own ministry. Verse 3 points out that John was ministering in the region of the Jordan River. So, that would have been a wilderness area that was most likely an uninhabited barren section near enough to the Jordan or other um, areas of water for baptisms to occur. Now, what do you think it means when it says that he was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Well, I guess it's kind of self-explanatory. If they would repent of their sins, he would baptize them, right? So then what does it mean to repent? Well, this is the Greek word menenoia, which means a change of heart or mind, a reversal or a reformation. It's not just confessing sin. It's not even just feeling sorry that we have sinned, but actually choosing to turn away from it, to like turning from sin, turning to God. And then what was the significance of baptism? Well, this baptism would have been an outward sign of that inward repentance. It was done before God as an act of turning to him. It also would have been something that the Jews would have at least been familiar with. A Gentile converting to Judaism uh, would go through baptism as part of that process. A Gentile would have been seen as unclean, and so the baptism would have been a form of, of like a ceremonial washing. So they would have at least been familiar with this idea of baptism, although the Jews themselves might not have seen their need for it. Verse 4 then uh, gives us a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40, which echoes what we talked about last week, is um, about how John the Baptist would pre prepare the way for the Lord. So this passage fits well today as if we are, to some extent, continuing on where we left off last week. But what do you think verses 4 to 6 mean? Well, what jumps out to me from these verses is the idea of things being made straight or right, like crooked ways being compared to straight paths. Or like if you were walking on a path and clearing it from obstructions, making it ready, leveling it out for whoever is coming, right? We could kind of see this as John being like a herald going ahead of a procession, calling out for people to make way for the one who is coming. It's a beautiful image when we think of repentance being the way to prepare our hearts for the arrival of the Savior, getting rid of sin and self, dealing with bad patterns of living and wrong habits and brokenness and things like that, removing the obstructions in our lives that are in the way. So John was out in the wilderness calling the people to repentance and baptizing them. The next few verses give us a bit of his sales pitch about why they should be baptized. Let's pick things up with verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Wow, um, those are kind of strong words, aren't they? Notice that verse 7 points out that these were people who were um, coming out to be baptized, who were coming there to hear him and to, to, to do this, not it wasn't not about the, those who, who were left behind, who stayed home. 
Um, Matthew does seem to suggest that maybe there were some Pharisees and whatnot involved, but um, it's interesting. John calls them brood of vipers and challenges them about why they were fleeing from the wrath to come. What do you think of all that? So a viper would have been a venomous serpent, and a brood uh, would refer to offspring or fruit or produce. So he's saying that they were products of serpents. It's not exactly the way to make friends and influence people. You know, I think one of the things that we find from John the Baptist is a boldness that allows him to speak his mind and not hold back. And not, I don't think he's chastising them for coming out necessarily. I think he's questioning their motives. So why were they really there? He says, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. What do you think that means? Well, if the word repentance is about turning, changing, reforming, then that change should show, right? True repentance should be able to be seen in the corresponding fruit. If the fruit is not there, then did true repentance actually ever really happen? The repentance should show up in their lives. I think that's a pretty powerful phrase. He then went on to kind of challenge their lineage. He refers to them looking at themselves as, a, as children of Abraham, who was their forefather. In Genesis 12, we see God's covenant with Abraham, promising to make him into a great nation and that he would bless them and, and that through them he would bless all nations. But here John is saying that it doesn't matter if they're children of Abraham. God could make children of, children from the stones themselves if need be. What do you think that's all about? So he's talking about how people were, the people were relying upon their heritage as children of Abraham for their salvation as if they were good simply because of who they were, about, because of, of, of their nationality, of, the, of, of who their forefathers were. He was saying that they could not rest and rely upon their heritage. He was calling them to something more. And he then speaks of cutting down trees, which fits this earlier part about bearing fruit, right? A tree that doesn't bear fruit should be chopped down so that there is room for a tree that will bear fruit. It reminds me of what Jesus talked about in John 15 with the, the vine and the branches. Overall, this is quite strong. John is not pulling any punches. He is calling out sin. He reminds me a little bit of like the, the bullhorn guy standing on the street corner um, of some like urban center with, with a sign that calls out sin and yelling about how they need to repent, right? You ever seen someone like that? Being around them can be kind of uncomfortable. John is boldly calling people to authentic repentance, tearing down their facade of self-worth and religiosity. He is calling them to get real with God. Now let's take a quick look at their response of the people before talking about what we should do from all this. And let's pick things up with verse 10. And the crowds asked them, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you were authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Okay, so now wait a second. Is John here saying that if they do these things, they would be forgiven or saved? Is it just enough for them to just give up their tunic or, um, or for tax collectors to collect only what they were supposed to do or for soldiers to stop extorting people? Is that good enough? No, that's not what this is saying. This goes back to the bearing fruit and keeping with repentance phrase. This is, this is what this look, that looks like. It, true repentance leads to a changed life. It, it leads to fruit. And he is talking about some of the ways, some of the specific ways that that fruit might show itself. In particular, tax collectors were notorious for levying taxes that were unfair, charging people extra and keeping it for themselves. And soldiers were some kind of like mafia henchmen or bullies who were extorting people for protection. So whether it was for those specific people or the crowd in general, he was calling for them to care for the needs of others and living 
in justice and honesty and generosity. Not that that was what would save them, but as part of an overall repentant and changed life. It would show that true repentance. Now notice that the people were moved by all this and it caused them to question if maybe John himself was the Messiah. But John quickly set the record straight. I love his humility and the way he speaks of how he was not even good enough to undo the strap of the Lord's sandal. Isn't that cool? And he speaks of a baptism of the Holy Spirit and a fire. He uses the illustration of the winnowing fork and the threshing floor. And in that image, uh, the grain was tossed into the air and the good grain, the, the, the grain itself would drop back down to the threshing floor and the chaff, the lighter stuff, would kind of blow a bit and be separated and burned up. It's a really interesting passage that is filled with some strong and even harsh words at times. And I love how verse 18 points out that with many other words, he spoke the good news to them. Kind of interesting, considering the harshness of the first 17 verses, right? As we close, I want to ask you this final question. What do you think of that ending? So it's interesting that the Greek word in verse 18 for the good news is the word euangelizo. It means good news. It's the gospel. It is the word from which we even get our idea of evangelism. But this passage overall seems harsh to us. When we think of sharing the gospel or the good news, we think of the story of a little baby coming to earth and eventually dying for the sins of the world. We think of forgiveness and grace and salvation. You know, my main class that I teach at Crown College is all about the gospel. And I, I would never encourage my students to call their friends a brood of vipers. But I think that this is the good news. You see, the good news begins with the bad news. In order for us to understand our need for a savior, we first must rec recognize our need to be saved. We need to understand our dilemma. We need to come face to face with our sin. John was challenging people to consider their lives, to stop trusting in their own self-worth or goodness. He was challenging them to drop their spiritual facade and stop relying upon their heritage and to wake up and get real with themselves and to see their sin and unrighteousness. He was calling them to repent, to turn from their sin. That recognition of sin, that willingness to authentically look at our lives and see the need for a savior prepares the way for us to receive him. The recognition of sin must precede the acceptance of grace. John the Baptist was preparing the way for Christ by calling the people to prepare their hearts for him, by looking at themselves and recognizing their need. And he was calling them to a true repentance, a repentance that shows up in fruit, a changed life, a choice that sin can no longer reign in their lives. It's throwing off who they were and even the religious facades and even the good that maybe they think they have done and recognizing their need for a savior. What a great Advent reminder as we come into Christmas. And I want to challenge us with that. To, to have our hearts over these, this next couple of weeks as we lead into Christmas, to really be open to the work that God wants to do in us, to, to let him expose the sin that is still there and to repent and turn to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time. I thank you for this message. I pray that you would help us to, to throw off our sin, our spiritual facades, even the, that which we think that we have done that is good and recognize more and more completely how much we need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.